The Sleepers Podcast, Wednesday, October 2nd. Uh, today is actually Tuesday when we're recording this. You know that by now. Tigers playoff game today. So I got the jersey on. Cars got the hat on. Uh, by the time you're listening to this, game two will be this afternoon. And I hope that we're eagerly anticipating trying to close out this series. Cartel, how are you feeling today, my friend? I'm feeling gritty. Are we gritty, Greg? Like, did, like if we went around and asked, like, I don't know, let's say, 25 to 50 people on the street about sleepers media podcasts besides the folks that say who what would be one word that they think people would use to describe us um <laughs> are we getting any you. are we getting any gritty shouts no i and me me will never and you let's be honest we will combine individually or collectively never be considered gritty now Let, don't don't put that on me I mean, do we need to do like a whole psychoanalysis historically here of you and I? Like, we we you, do not, we're not grit. We're not. You want to do the his, you want to do the historical thing? You want to know what's gritty? Overcoming slavery. Okay, you, are you taking credit for overcoming slavery? I am taking credit for my ancestors. What did rebelling you against, rebelling against you? What did you personally contribute to the emancipation of slaves? Me personally, nothing wasn't alive. Yeah, so I I think it was your ancestors who may have been gritty. So no, like transitive gritty property here. I don't think that's how the transitive property were. I just like in, evaluating myself on grit throughout my life. Like what what's the grittiest thing I've ever done? I'm not gonna lie. Us <laughs> driving twenty hours to go somewhere that we didn't even have credentials for and just showing up is pretty gritty. I think that was delusional more than anything. Ah, Is is there a difference between blue collar and grit? Cause I do think we're blue collar as a duo, like sleepers media is blue collar sleepers media works hard and came from nothing. Mm -hmm. You and I work sort of hard and came from a lot. Yeah, there's a difference too. I feel like because we we work hard and we work harder than others, but also if adversity strikes, we find a way just to be like, okay, adversity, you got this one. We'll beat you next time. Gritty would take adversity head on. I really don't want to come face to face with adversity if I have a choice. I stubbed my toe on the corner of a table about eight days ago, and I've really been reevaluating like my day to day decisions since then. Like I, it's distracting to my daily life. I I don't think I can classify myself as gritty. Yeah. The gash on my leg just healed up too. That's good. Yeah. Finally. Is it like, or does it feel 100%? Like you wouldn't even tell you got gashed. It feels hundred percent with that said, given how it is healed, it's a massive scar. I should have got stitches. You know, it's sort of hindsight though. You, you finishing that golf round was gritty. That's I got you know I have a gritty moment now and then I think yeah I don't think I've ever had a gritty moment you did but I can't think of one right now I did but you just don't know what it is <laughs> I don't know because I I don't I I consider you to be a a gritty a gritty fella I think I'm resourceful I think that's different are, okay gritty. yep you're right you're right yeah which is kind of like like the way I'm resourceful is like in a clever manipulative way not necessarily a, although you know what maybe i'm not giving myself enough credit because dion always says i'm most dangerous when my back's against the wall that yeah, you are special when your back's against the wall like like i guess that's the example of my grit is like my betting bank rolls down to 250 dollars. okay 250 to 18 k in the snap of a finger but that just that feels like a white collar way to be gritty, and I want to be a blue collar guy. Yeah, you know we'll work on it. Uh, I now I'm thinking of a segment that we're gonna do coming up though, where I actually do go to 50 people on the street and ask them one word to describe Sleepers Media, and I want to know how many like who's we get, how many jackasses we get, you know what words we get. Yeah, if you ask 50 people one word to describe Sleepers Media right now, 48 of them would say who. 
and then the other two would be like idiots. That would be that'd be all we get right now. That's, That's okay. Awesome. Honestly, yeah. that summary in general is gritty. That is, <laughs> and we're still here every day. <laughs> That's extremely, extremely gritty. Do you have a YouTube comment today? I do. God, I miss this. I'm gonna say that <laughs> probably for like four more weeks. Every single episode, just like, oh God, I miss this. Uh, let's go with um you know what just because i want to understand this and i want to get where you're at on this uh there's a lot of comments on the five star darius adams commits to uconn video saying so this means braylon mullins out at uconn i don't know if i've asked you how you feel about that or where you stand on that um does this are you put are you saying braylon mullins is going to be a hoosier is he going to be a husky is he going to find his way to North Carolina? Like, where, where are you at in the Braylon Mullen sweepstakes, I guess? That last one is what he's not going to do. He's not going to North Carolina. Uh, okay. Yeah. Dion and I have done a lot of back and forth on Braylon the last couple of days. We did talk about it a little bit in the Adams video, you and I, but Dion and I have since made some more shorts this morning about UConn's recruiting class. Uh, I believe this is Indiana versus UConn. I believe UConn believes they have a really good shot at this. UConn has also moved and is trying to get a visit from Jacob Furphy, Jacob Furphy, a shooting guard, the the shooting guard that Illinois wants to mm-hmm. me. You don't make phone calls to Jacob Furphy if you feel great about where Braylon Mullins is. So I, I, the body language PhD has been loud about this one, but it is solidified. It's a firm. I'm not changing this prediction unless I hear something groundbreaking. Braylon Mullins to Indiana is the formal prediction from the body language PhD. Um, and yeah, I do think Darius Adams is part of that, respectfully. I, I Now, Indiana's loaded in the backcourt too, but there's just so many mouths to feed in the UConn backcourt. And I get that Dan Hurley wants more guards, but um, that doesn't mean he gets to just pick from guards that think they're one and dones and want to get to the NBA quickly. He's going to have to find some guards that want to sit and wait a year. And I don't think Braylon Mullins is that. We'll see if I'm right. We'll see if I'm wrong. Do you agree with that, by the way? you haven't. Uh, I don't think you've commented on where you're at with that. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense as much as I don't want to be like admit that Braylon Mullins is going to be a Hoosier. Um, I think everything points to that right now. Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm at as well. All right, join the Discord, nine ninety nine a month. Uh, we've got a lot of activity in the Discord. We got a lot of fun things planned for the upcoming season. Card over the weekend, I played a little game of where am I door dashing food from right now, and the first person to answer got a hundred dollars. Did you actually send out $100 as our director of finance? I did, yes. Nice. Yeah, shout out to Jay Hart for correctly guessing that Olga's is where I had DoorDash food from. See, this is the type of mischief antics that you're missing out on if you're not in the Discord. One of my favorite things about sleepers, by the way, is just the simple fact that uh, you are the only person who runs our finances, and I don't even have access to the bank. So at all times, I have no idea how much money our company has. And you have never told me like, sometimes I'll ask you like, where are we at in general? And you just respond very vaguely about how much money we have saved over the years. So I keep making financial promises to people that I don't even know if you can deliver on. Like, I'll just be like, Hey, hundred dollars to this person card, send it. And I don't know if we actually can afford it or not. So do you want to, you, can we address that publicly real quick? Like, we we could afford a hundred dollars to Jay Hart for guessing that I had Olga's for lunch. Yeah, we at this time we couldn't afford that. Um, and I, you know, you know what I I take pride in being the financial director of Sleepers Media. Um, I think it is something that is needed. Uh, and I think you should have solace. I think solace is a good word that I have control of the funds, Greg. I'm always going to have us in a great spot. You never got to worry about that. I mean, I do. It it is a comforting feeling to know that you are controlling money that affects my life. That's, that's comforting. Uh, I, what's not comforting is knowing like, I want to give out a hundred dollars every day. Like I, I want to be like, what coffee order did I get today? Here's a hundred dollars. You know, see, I, I I'm all for you doing that. That that's, that's fine. I'm going to have to have you lower the units though. We can't do a hundred. Just mm-hmm. forget. Like I'll throw 20 out to some folks. If you're going to do it a couple times a week. Unit management has always been a problem for me. Join the Discord, nine ninety nine a month. That's where you can get in on games like this. We start with a comment from Boom Fizzle, who says, if Signetti keeps winning, which it sadly looks like he will, how long before he gets poached by a big-name program? 
or does Indiana manage to empty the bank to keep him? I, listen, if there is a opportunity for the Blue, the Bloomington Bucks, is what I like to call them, to be empty, the Bloomington Bank, Bloomington Credit Union, uh, I, I think they open the bank for them. I do too. They have a lot of money, and football money is going to become, or basketball money is going to become football money here soon if Signetti keeps winning. Sleeve Nash says, now that Marcus Damask has made the Bulls training camp roster, do you think he can secure a spot on the team? If he doesn't make the Bulls, do you see opportunities for him with other NBA teams? Uh, listen, I'll never say that any player in today's NBA would not have a chance to get an opportunity with teams. Like there was a lot of times last season, like with the Blazers, where I was watching guys and I was like, oh, no way this guy's on the floor right now. Um, so I don't think it's ever off the table. Uh, with that said, having a training camp spot is not really the most like ensuring thing. Like there's a lot of guys that get training camp roster spots and get to go to media day and take pictures that never ever suit up for that team, even at the G league level. So um, Marcus Damas is going to make a lot of money playing basketball. I think, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't want to say a lot. He's going to make a really good living playing basketball at some level. It just depends where it is. <laughs> He's going to make a lot of money. I don't mean to say a lot. Let me walk. Because well, like when you say a lot in NBA terms, that's like millions and millions of dollars. I, I don't know if that's going to be Marcus Damas, but he's going to, he's going to make enough that if he wants to, he could shut down this program. Yeah. So a lot in our world, that's what Marcus yeah. is going to make. Uh, yeah. I, I think Marcus Damas is a guy that ends up playing NBA games here and there, like spot two way contract type stuff. I won't be surprised if he pops off and has like a 20 point game. Won't be surprised if he proves his value and ends up getting signed by a team for a while. I don't expect him to make the bulls. Um, I think you look at the other guys they brought in in that, that training camp group too. I don't expect any of those guys to make the bulls. These are just like long shot type. Oh, good to have you around type things, which is good by the way. If I'm Marcus to mass, that's exactly what I want. I want to be in the mix. I want to play summer league. I want a bunch of NBA organizations to call me and give me a practice Jersey until something breaks my way and something happens. Dwight John Wall says, Greg, you worded it very nicely in the Michael Brown and uh, Chris Sinak video. I just believe us Kentucky fans got sick of Cal's coaching of the freshmen. Of course, we want the most talent. It just got old watching year after year with all the talent, not do anything with it. Just something simple as not allowing someone to hit 10 threes on you. Uh, yeah, if you are unfamiliar with what's being referenced here, Cart, Kentucky hosted Mike Hell Brown and Chris Sinak on visits this past weekend in the middle of trying to get a Caden Lewis and uh, what's the for Caleb Wilson, who mm. like they're subtweeting each other, acting like they're all going to Kentucky. And now Mark Pope wants more five stars to also come with them to Kentucky at the same position. It's just kind of a weird like. Like Mark Pope is very clearly going after one and duns when Kentucky fans kind of told us that wasn't the plan they liked anymore with Cal. Do you have any thoughts? Listen, I, I just think that <laughs> I don't know if it's because I'm like a, a fan of another team, but like complaining about like watching year after year, all that talent, I, the, the, the not do anything part is what does it for me. Like these, these are teams that were winning a lot of games. Like I get like, they got Golki, that sucks. And like these two top, these two first round draft picks just got put in a locker, shoved in a locker by Blake Lampman and Jack Golki, which sucks. But like, damn, that was a really good team. And like, I, sometimes March is fluky. We say it all the time. I don't know. It all literally just comes down to March being fluky. Like, we just got tired of Jack Golki hitting 10 threes. Yeah, of course. Welcome to March. That happens. Like, I get that Cal could have made strategic defensive adjustments, and that's Ralph's biggest point on why he was pro the moving on from Cal Perry. But like, also sometimes dudes just do weird shit in March. That happens all the time. Like if Purdue had moved on from Matt Painter because he got fairly Dickinson, what a foolish decision that would have been in hindsight. It's gonna have to play out how Mark Pope does, but his career, much like Calipari's did, just to be clear, his career will come down to what happens in March. Like he assembled the same rosters and March is fluky. That's a scary place for any coach to have to define themselves in. Tristan Freeman says, what have you learned from your first year in dynasty and college football 25? Also, does anyone want to join the Xbox or PlayStation five groups ahead of next season? Uh, I mean, the main thing I learned is that like, you need to actually pick a good team. Like I got BYU and it sucks. Yeah. What was your record at the end of the year? Did you, you limp to the finish line? 
Uh, I think I won like five games. Do you have a promising recruiting class at least? Uh, no. <laughs> how, many, how many guys did you sign? Did you start recruiting in week 12? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, I think I sit at zero currently. You going to hit the portal hard? Probably not. So you're just you're just gonna show up with a worse version of the BYU team that won five games this year? Yeah, and just try to be gritty, just try to ruin seasons. <laughs> yeah, understood. Uh what have I learned? I've learned Tristan's an idiot. Tristan put me through to the championship game after Ethan beat me in the semi and it caused havoc in the league. Uh Dion and I were pulling this this trick where basically we refused to actually play each other. We wanted to drag this out as long as we possibly could just to annoy everybody because Dion and I are champions together. We've never been against each other in a championship setting. So our plan firmly was to never play the game. And if people forced us to play the game, we were going to simulate the game and have you do commentary on it. So we could pin it all on you. It was a genius plan. We could pin it on you for the reason it hadn't happened. And uh, yeah, people got annoyed with us. Ralph just pushed us forward to the off season without even letting us play the rifle championship game. So I'm anti Ralph. I'm anti Treeman or, or Tristan. I should call him Treeman, Tristan Freeman. This is not a democracy anymore. I'm not having fun. With that said, uh, I have vacated my position after leading Mississippi State to the national championship game. I have taken a job offer in Lincoln, Nebraska. I have joined Dion Hillford's staff. I am his offensive coordinator. I am excited to work with Dylan Riola. Uh, three more years left. I, I think we can do great things together. Can you add me as like an analyst? If you, I feel like Dion would probably be in favor of you being the defensive coordinator. Honestly, please, please, yeah, let's let's talk, let's have a conversation right. offline. Dwight John Wall says Dion saying Carson Beck sucks is crazy. He just threw for four hundred thirty nine yards at Alabama. Maybe just maybe it's just Kentucky's defense made him look bad. Look, Carson Beck is not bad. He's a good quarterback. The Carson Beck being like the number one overall pick is a black eye on the NFL. If so. Yeah, he's not bad. I wouldn't want him as my quarterback still. Like, if I'm a championship team, I I just wouldn't like going into battle every week knowing Carson Beck's the guy, you know? Well, I mean, you're Michigan right now. What does they look like with Carson Beck? Better, but I'm, I'm saying if I'm a championship team. Like, you don't – can you win a championship with Carson Beck as your quarterback? You can. Can. It's the same way I think I think the Lions can win a Super Bowl with Jared Goff at quarterback. Gotcha. Like well, the, the only reason I bring this up is because I did see a lot. There was someone was talking about it in our disc our Discord, I think, where they were comparing JJ McCarthy to Carson Beck. Yeah, I think JJ is a lot more dynamic than Carson Beck, honestly. I think JJ, like, say what you want about him. He had a lot of like mobility stuff that was big. Like you could run him. You could do a lot of play action, throw on the run stuff. I just don't I like Carson Beck's an arm talent. He's a really good arm and he's also kind of a dur. and I just don't trust him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Sleeve says, uh, what are your thoughts on these uniforms? And it's the new Iowa state basketball uniforms. Go look up a picture of these. If you haven't seen them, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I like the jerseys, um, everything else about the photo. I'm not liking, like, why is he on the sideline of the football stadium dribbling an indoor ball outside? That's one of my biggest pet peeves. Uh, but I like the jerseys. I think the jerseys are nice, but the jerseys look awful with red accessories and Tame and Lipsy's the photographed player here. He has a red headband, a red undershirt, red leg sleeves, red shoes that, with an all Tame yellow jersey. That is Tammy Lipsy, yeah. Oh, I thought that was Ty Allen. <laughs> it does look like Ty Allen. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just go if you're going yellow jersey, wear yellow accessories. If you're going red jersey, wear red accessories. Don't mismatch. It looks weird. It looks like a creative player that I made as a 12 year old. Uh, not a huge fan. By the way, indoor basketball outside. So I need a quick check on you on this. Uh, I bought like an Evolution indoor ball for Murphy to be her first basketball and we bring it to parks and we'll just dribble and shoot it outside. It's like a cute little, this is my daughter's ball. Are you okay with that move? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine with like, like you said, buying a indoor evolution ball and it becoming an outside ball. But once it is, it, once it's an outside ball, it's an outside ball. Don't yeah, bring it in. Never bring that inside. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm, I'm completely fine with that. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's my daughter's ball. That's going to be her first ball forever. We're going to hold that ball 30 years from now and say, this was the ball we brought special stuff. Malik says, uh, well, Izzo strikes out two more times. He needs to get Jordan Scott and Cam Ward to commit while still going after the big fish, but get those two now. I, it'd be nice to get those two, but I, I think, like I said in another video, I think we only lead for one, and it ain't Cam Ward. Simpleton Friday says, how many NBA players could you put on a 16 seed and win the tournament with? Uh, depending on the NBA player, I think you could put one player on a 16 seed and they could win it all. Yeah, but who? He wants to know like how uh, how many could be that one. How many NBA players would you put on a sixteen? Um, yeah, Luca. I would start with Luca. I would. Yeah. I would say Jokic. I put Ann Edwards up there. See, I don't. I don't think right now, Ant's a guarantee to win six. You don't think? Well, the thing is, though, you put Jokic there. Like, you don't care that he's not a guard. No, I just. I think Jokic and Luca manipulate every play of the game so much. Like. To me, Anna, your 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 six game run with Ann Edwards would just come down to like, does he avoid the like seven for thirty game from the field, which he yeah. still might do in college right now, if we're being honest. Yeah, uh, Bron, I think I'll put on there too. Still, you put Bron still, Bron still, yeah. That's an interesting toss up to me at this stage in his career. Like, normally it would be an automatic yes, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna still put the guy that averaged twenty seven five and seven last year. Yeah, I hear that. Also, there's got to be a respect factor here. I think the young dickheads of the college basketball world would be too enamored about playing Bron. I think it also depends on the right sixteen seed too. Like if you put him on the worst sixteen seed, I think everybody's struggling. But Wemby, I would put Wemby in the mix. Wemby would be, yeah, Wemby could definitely do it. I think you put Wemby there right now. He probably does it. Yeah. Uh, let's see who else. The White John Wall says Greg have to admit fourth most wins in SEC football is pretty impressive. He made a list of every SEC football team's wins since 2017. Kentucky's fourth. Sure. I, I, John Wall, I don't know what to do with this. You're like really, really adamant that we got to talk about how good Kentucky football is, man. I don't know. I don't know. You beat Ole Miss. That's a good win. You should have yeah. beat Georgia. You didn't. Like. <laughs> This list, this list is hilarious. Like, congrats! You have one more win than Texas A and M, um, who it like hasn't even been in the SEC that football that long. You got four more than Florida and four more than Auburn. Congrats! Yeah, like the the takeaway for me from this is that the SEC outside of the top two teams has honestly been shockingly bad. For, <laughs> like Bama and Georgia both got eighty six and eighty five respectfully, and then you got the rest. Yeah, like I'm I'm just way less afraid of the SEC than I thought I was. It's really just the top two teams, but yeah, I don't know. Like you, you can claim uh, Kentucky, ooh, we're good good at football, sure, but like it just it doesn't go anywhere for me. I don't want to spend that much more time on this. Show. I'll enjoy your football team; it's good, but like, good. What do you need? Like, you, do you want a trophy for being fourth in the SEC over the last eight years? Like that, that alone should tell you that we can't take you seriously as a football fan. You're ecstatic that you're fourth in the SEC. I Manor says, do you think Carter might be catering or no, excuse me. Do you think Carter might be cartering you <laughs> about watching so much premier league? If he is watching it, I expect him to start every sentence about a player he likes with. He's a proper lad in a British accent. When he comes back, Dion was really gassing up how, uh, like we were talking about, like, I wonder what cart's doing right now. And when's he going to return? We don't know. And Dion would just provide a daily update on, well, I know he's spending a lot of time on the Premier League right now. Does may not have time for other things, but he's he's more active than I've ever seen him in the Premier League right now. So where are you at with the EPL right now? Uh well, uh my team just lost our Ballon d'Or winner to a goddamn ACL injury and he's out for the year. Uh KDB is currently hurt as well. Uh so I'm I'm kind of in shambles right now. I'm not gonna lie to you. But uh, listen, I'm always tapped in with the Mandem over and over on over across the pond. Shout out to my ends. Shout out to Brixton. Uh, shout out to Mandem FC. Uh, I'm always rocking with uh, the Premier League, the footy world. Uh, it's it's a great thing to get into. It truly is. I, I, I recommend everyone at least give it a try for sure, especially if you're like an avid sports fan, because that shit truly does go on year round. Like if you're a soccer fan you can get a fix damn near whenever you want, if you want it. You done? 
Yeah. Okay, cool. I tried, man. I tried. You try to get me into EPL. I can promise you the next pandemic, I'm going to be locked in. But when when other sports are going on, it's just, I don't know. And also, like, EPL has been hard because your team has been so good and it's been annoying. That I mean, but the one year you joined, your team won the title. At Champions League. That's got. I mean, that's got to feel. I mean, I maybe just because you're not invested in it, but like that's got to feel good. I the the thing that frustrates me truly about football is, like they. I grew emotionally attached to my first team that won the Champions League. That's great. Two years later, there was one guy in the lineup that was still on the team. Like I, I do not like how much the sport turns over. It would be an amazing time to be a Chelsea fan. I must say for you. Yeah, well, they're they're a young bull rock team, and they're just fun, and they're a bunch of young dickheads, and it's great. Cole Palmer, Cole Palmer, in it, ah, special. Uh, Bright Star Jones says, "What Big Ten basketball coach most closely reflects Captain Kurt Signetti's start at IU? Who is most likely to pull a Ryan Walters at Purdue?" I like this question, who could be like a? Well, I guess there aren't too many year one coaches in the league right now, but like who reminds you their trajectory of Signetti. A big time basketball coach most closely reflects Kurt Signetti's start at IU. I don't know if there is really one that is like that. Is there like who's been like a first time big Ten coaches has come in and been like round, like turning a program around. I might have an answer, um, but I want to make sure I'm not missing another coach right now. Was it Jawan being successful in his first year? No, because you got to be legitimately good, I think. But I, I think it know. might be. I think it might be a good one because I don't know if Kirsten is legitimately good. All right, here's my answer. So part of the Signetti thing is you got to have been hired in a cycle where people thought other coaches were better hires than you, mm-hmm. and then you just come in like. Dog, look at my resume. All I do is win. I think in the future, there's a chance that Jake Diebler becomes that. Ooh. Because everyone's like, he's probably deep down already pissed off that like nobody takes him serious. Meanwhile, everyone's gassing up Dusty May as this big hire at his rival. And maybe Jake Diebler just like has some shit to him. Maybe he wins at Ohio State, goes elsewhere. And then we're talking when he leaves the Ohio State job for like the North Carolina job 20 years from now. Uh, Jake Dealer's like, all I do is win. Look at the resume. I could see that happening. Who's Good most thought. likely to pull a Ryan Walters at Purdue? I assume that's just flop completely. It's a flop completely. Uh, Feels Ben Johnson y. Yeah, I thought, but the thing is, I, I still think Ben Johnson's a good coach. It's just, I, I don't know what he can do. Feels Ben Johnson y to me. Like the wheels, wheels fall off, and we're just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, Sully says, if you were to have the ability to go back in time, what decisions would you make to alter your basketball programs, whether it be a coach's hiring or pushing all your chips in on a different recruit? What would it be? Oh, easy for me. Um, It would be never, ever to let Dane Fife step foot in Michigan State's basketball offices ever. (laughs) I'm surprised that was easy. What do you think that would actually change so much? Like – you just think you'd never get the Clarkston guys and other guys are better? Never get the Clarkston guys. That's it. That's all that matters. <laughs> that would save it personally, it would save me a lot of pain. Okay. I think my answer is uh ah, this is such a hard one to say though, because like the guy we ended up with instead of this guy was the starting point guard on a national championship runner up. But I think the answer is you go all in on Cassius Winston and wait because the, the rumor was Cassius Winston was leaning Michigan and then beeline took Xavier Simpson because he was annoyed that Cassius canceled the visit to go to like prom or some shit. And Michigan basically took Simpson said, yeah, we won't take you to Cassius. And he ends up such a beloved Part of the program, Michigan State guy. So that, that that's a, a monumental shift. But then Move. at the same time, like it almost 
Like it was, but it wasn't because Michigan was still really good in those years. You know? Yeah. I guess it's just like, would they have been even better with Cassius instead of Simpson? Like probably. Probably. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of crazy. That would be my answer. Uh, Cobra says, was randomly thinking about how cool of an event the Crossroads Classic was. If you could create your own college basketball preseason tournament, what would it be? I don't know who it would be, what it involved, but I know what the rules would be. If you lose, you get one of your players taken. That's all I want. That'd be fun. Uh, I've floated the idea of the champions classic being replaced with actual champions. I still like that cut, cut the random blue bloods and just give the teams that win the championship, like the right to earn it. Uh, I also would really like to put like eight schools that actively don't use the portal and NIL and make them play for money. Like, let me get (laughs) Purdue versus Michigan state in November for like $2 million in NIL funds. And they both try to just lose the game on purpose. And they, they throw the game. Malik says, now that Carter is back, don't ever do that husky pose again. You acted like a cat, not a dog. P.S. Birds have four talents, not three, animal expert. I'm pretty sure there's some birds with three talents. Let's check that real quick. How many talents? Can we get the stats in research department on this? Am I am I back? I thought I was still on paternity leave. Most that. birds have four toes. Oh, okay. Well, there you go, Malik. You got that one. I hope a bald eagle swoops down and you use one of those four talons to poke you in your big ass forehead. Malik says, "How much crying you've been doing, Carter, since Izzo didn't get a five star?" A lot. What? Like, I'm sorry. Do we not want five stars? It, am I am I in the wrong for being sad about not getting five stars? I don't think so. Okay, I'm wondering. <laughs> Malik says, how about the Mets? They're amazing, baby. Amazing. Glad to see my team make playoffs and the Tigers as well. <laughs> of course, Malik's a Mets fan. What do you think all of Malik's fandoms are? So right now we have Notre Dame football, Michigan State basketball, Mets. I think that part of him liking the Mets is he's shaped like that purple grimace thing that they like their team rallies around. He's probably got the same IQ as it as well. No, hey, no, Edwin Diaz has to turn that 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 in. That trumpet shit's played out now because he comes in and just gives up homers. Yeah, that wasn't great. Uh, final one from Malik. Glad to have Carter back. Hope you're feeling good. We all missed you. I didn't miss you at all, Malik, but it's good to be back. <laughs> Hurley's undies say, which, if any, of the recent national champions would last year's Purdue team have beat? They would have beat that Virginia team. I think they would have beaten the Ochag Baji Kansas team. Yeah, I think so too. Um, uh, let's see. They might have beat that team also that the the Remy Martin team. Is that the team you're referring to? Sorry. Yeah. Ocha. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. Team. I yeah. think they beat twenty two Kansas. I think they put up a better fight against twenty one Baylor than Gonzaga did, but I think they would still lose. Uh nineteen Virginia. Yeah, probably. Probably that's neither of the Villanovas. Maybe just yeah. Virginia and Kansas. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's why you make a video and you've got a, current, a commemorative silver patch on the back of your jerseys moving forward to always remember that. Really unsettling, by the way, that the team with so much gold in their color scheme now has a silver patch. I don't like that. Yeah, well, they, they were the silver medalists this year. Also, kind of a bold move or like just a ruthless move by the NCAA to make teams wear a reminder permanently that they didn't get it done in the title game. Like, I'd be sick. I was I was told this is permanent. It's not just for a year. They have to wear that on their jersey forever. It is, but like, why are you saying the NCAA did that? They they made them do this? I thought Purdue's just doing this no, to commemorate it. Every, every, every team does it. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, apparently every every team that like makes the title game, if you if you win it, you get a gold patch. If you lose, you get silver. That's ass. It, I would not ever want to do that if I no. was the loser. Uh, let's see. T fan says, if you need someone to help you guys tap into the realm of baseball now that it's the postseason, let me know. I'm your guy for baseball more than just the Tigers. Should we hire T fan to do baseball? Uh, unfortunately, T fan, uh, we have. We have someone who holds that position, whether they want it, want it or not. Uh, Cole Schaefer, if you're out there, uh, <laughs> you'll always you'll always be our baseball correspondent, no matter what. Haven't heard that name in eight years, but Cole Schaefer, hope you're doing well, my friend. I think he just <laughs> got married recently. That's special. Call Me the Breeze says, quickly opine on the port strike. Word on the street is this will cost the U.S. economy $5 billion per day. 
All right. I hate this bit, Breeze. I don't like the bit at all. That's what I'm But he can. Goaded on the stick says, question for Cart, who is the goat of hip-hop? Is it Kendrick or Kanye? And why do you feel so passionately for one or the other? It's neither of those two. It's Aubrey Graham. Ah. And if you disagree, go listen to Middle of the Ocean and then, then get back to me. Still feel good about it, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I Maynard says I may be off base, but feels like Hurley has been and is getting guys. Izzo would want. <laughs> I think I Maynard means that is like a really truthful comment, but it's just cracking me up to like slide that in right now. <laughs> Unreal. Call me the breeze says rest in peace, Pete Rose. Would the sleepers have put Rose in the Hall of Fame during his lifetime? Of course, an avid better like himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Pete's honor, uh, I will be placing. Irresponsible, responsible bets with my bookie today. I'm looking for Facts. Goaded on the stick says, G, where do you stand on cart? <laughs> he's generational. I think he's Thanks, a, he's, he's a generational person. Appreciate appreciate that, man. <laughs> Anytime. Guy says, rank every member of our football group chat based on the entertainment value they provide in the chat. He means in the football group chat, I assume. So rank our football group chat in terms of entertainment. I'm not going to rank everyone in terms of entertainment just because I don't feel like doing it. Um, but I will say this. I have a most underrated entertaining, entertainment person in there. I think it's Bobby. That, that's a great shout by you. Bobby Howard is the most underrated entertainer, entertaining guy in the football group chat. Yeah, Bob, I love Bobby's content in general. I also love just like texting him because the man is truly hilarious and he enjoys his Saturdays. I think he has more fun on Saturdays than I do. And that's a hard thing to do. So, uh, yeah, everybody's entertaining in that group chat. Good group chat. Coleman Spurner says, we get it. You're in a football group chat guy. Clear headed Illini fan says, to be completely honest, I didn't even realize somebody was filling in for cart the last few weeks until today when you welcomed him back. Is Amon Ra a top five receiver in the NFL? Uh, first off, we can't just flow by that. I you got to be a little disrespected. They didn't notice you were gone there. No, that's fine. That that makes sense. I don't think so. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a line I fan. Nothing's ever. It's fine. Oh, everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> Do you think that like who could we sub me out with and people wouldn't notice? Is there anyone that comes to mind? Like, could we just have Ralph do me for three weeks and it'd feel the same? I think Ralph. I think Evan Meyer would be able to sub in as well. No one would pick up on it. Uh, there's a couple. All right. Let's just keep an eye on that. Is Amon Ra top five well. receiver in the NFL? Is Amon Ra top five receiver in the NFL? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I usually put him right around the fifth position. Um, and I feel pretty good about him being there. But I don't know. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say yes. Uh but if someone has them out, has him outside, I'm I'm fine with that. Can we go down the list of our top five real quick? I feel like number one's got to be Jake Jettis. Yeah, Jefferson's in there. Uh, Jamar Chase is in there. I'm putting. I'm still putting Tyreek Hill in there as well. I take. I'm taking somebody different at two. I'm just. I'm just going my five. I'm okay. not going in order here. Um. Okay. See, there's one in my top five that I think belongs there. I think Malik Neighbors is a top five. That's my already. Malik Neighbors is my number two in the league right now. I think Malik Neighbors is so good. I saw someone tweet that like taking an LSU wide receiver is like taking a Kentucky guard in basketball, and I've never felt like more in, in tune with that. That, that never, makes sense. Never felt more seen. <laughs> yeah, I literally never felt more seen. I, um, so those those top four got to be consensus ahead of. Amon Ra to me. You got to take neighbors given what he's looked like this year. And I think Hill, Chase, Jefferson are like non arguable. The fifth spot gets interesting though, but I, yeah, I think there are some names. Right. Cause guys like to put like a uh, Devontae Adams in there. Like those are some guys that get shouts sometimes. Um, There's but, a name. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not going to take a name, but I think you should take a name. Oh, CD Lamb. CD Lamb deserves a shout up there as well. I think he's he's pretty clearly ahead of Amon Ra to me, but I know you're not a CD guy. No, nah, I I think I think CD has some sleepers tendencies. What about not AJ great. Brown? Hmm. AJ Brown. AJ Brown's yeah. AJ Brown's probably, there's some really good wide receivers. Can't stay like healthy. being a top ten wide receiver is better. Like being a top five is like you're unreal. Being top ten is fine. 
I want to have a sneaky conversation about Stefan Diggs. I and I know Nico Collins is also awesome, but like Diggs finds the end zone every week still. I think Nico Collins might be better than Diggs, though. They're both really good. Uh where does Cup land? I know he's hurt, but like, do you still give him that respect or no? I still give him respect. He's got to stay like part of it is you got to be available. So at the end of this, Amon Ra top ten receiver, not yeah. top five. Yeah. All right, two more here. Malik Perry says, Greg, on the bold prediction segment for MSU, why didn't you choose make a Final Four? If it was to happen, he would still be wrong because he damn sure ain't die trying. I I I can't predict Michigan State's make a Final Four. But I hear your point, Malik, but I, I can't predict that. What? I can't predict that. Final comment today is from A-Law. Not sure if this has been done, but one month away from the regular season. Can we get the winner predictions from the Champions Classic? Scores and top scorers for both games. Hmm. Okay, well, for starters, who's in the Champions Classic? <laughs> you don't know the four teams in the Champions Classic? Weren't they changing it like soon? <laughs> no. They need to, man. God damn, I'm sick of seeing this malarkey every year. No, it's uh, I I don't know the matchups though. Why don't I know the matchups? It's it's Michigan State and Kansas. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure, or positive. Uh, positive. Kansas and Michigan State, Kentucky, Duke. Uh, Kansas, Michigan State. I think Kansas wins that basketball game by 17 plus points, and the leading score is Hunter Dickinson with 27. I think that Kentucky versus Duke, I got Duke winning that game uh, by seven. I think Cooper Flag is the leading scorer with 24. I just realized how excited I am to watch Hunter Dickinson against Michigan State again and how excited I am to watch Mark Pope against Duke. This is going to be really fun. Um, I'm with you on the winners. I have Kansas by 27. I have Duke by 46. Biggest, oh, biggest, biggest blowout margin in Champions Classic history. Forty six is insane. I think it's a forty six point Duke win. Leading scorers, give me uh Cooper Flag and AJ Store. Sneaky from Michigan State. Mm. Okay, for, for for Kansas. Excuse me. Okay, that's the comments today. Great job, comment section. I appreciate you. Uh, we are presented by my bookie. The exclusive sports book of Sleepers Media, my bookie, where you can place all your bets with us. Promo code Sleepers, you can double your first deposit. Sign up, create an account, deposit money, get double whatever you deposit just by entering promo code Sleepers. Link in the description of this video. Cart, let's get to the show. Car, where do you stand on age? Um, uh, Unlike some people think, uh, it ain't nothing but a number. It's a very, very serious number, and it should be taken seriously at all times. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, do you like old? Do you like age? Do you like people that have hit a certain threshold? I do, yeah. It's, it's up to a certain point, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Andy Katz also likes age. He likes old. He likes super seniors. He has his top 10 super seniors in the country. Uh, this is yet another Andy Katz list. We've done a lot of Andy Katz lists in the time that you've been gone because uh, it's Katz. That's our guy. He's a pioneer and he keeps pumping out content at the rate that only we can dream to match. So here's Andy Katz's top 10 fifth year seniors in college basketball. Number one, Hunter Dickinson. Number two, Ryan Kalkbrenner. Three, Mark Sears. Four, RJ Davis. Five, Janai Broom. Six, Caleb Love. Seven, John L. Davis. Eight, Juwan Roberts. Nine, Norchad Omir. Ten, Kadari Richmond. One last ride car. Where did Katz go wrong? Where did he go right? Where did he go what? Where did he go wrong? Where did he go right? He he did he never goes wrong. Let's once again please respect Andrew Katz uh, when it when it comes to these type of lists. Look, when you make as many lists as Andy Katz does, you're going to have a mistake here and there, right? Like sometimes you are going to have some people in the wrong areas. And always people want to shout out his, you know, his failures, right? You got to give him credit. I think this might be his best list, to be honest with you. I think this might be Cat's best Whoa. list out of all of his lists. Yeah. Whoa. I'm, I'm, I am kind of in lockstep with him. Now, does do guys like Norchad O'Meara need to be, be behind Juwan Roberts? I don't think so. Does Kadari Richmond need to be as low as 10? No. I think he should be a lot higher. But as you go through this list, him having Dickinson, Kalkbrenner, Sears, Davis, 
Broom, in that order, followed by Caleb Love. I think this was a pretty damn good list. Also, a lot of good super seniors. Like, I know they should be good because they played for a long time, but there's some killers on this list. Yeah, imagine what college basketball would be without these guys. That's my takeaway from this. Like, these are all the good players in the country. And there's a world where they just don't play. And then we're, like, talking about other guys as if they're as good as these guys. It's kind of crazy to think about. Um, Okay, I got some quick, like, what are you doing here? Uh, Are you taking Kalk over Sears and Davis? I am not, but I'd be okay with someone taking Kalk over those guys. Are you taking Hunter Dickinson over Sears and Davis? I'm taking them over Davis. I'm not taking them over Sears. Like, I think, to me, if I'm making this list, it starts Mark Sears, RJ Davis, one, two. I would rather have those guys. And then Hunter Dickinson, three. And then... Jani Broom or Kalk four or five. So the same guys, just different order. Have we pivoted away from like like guards win in March? I mean, I know UConn just won back to back national championships with great big men, but they had some great guards too. Like to me, I would rather have the best two point guards in the country than just like a good center. But isn't this a, a best player list? Yeah, but like part of Part of my whole conversation is like I think having that type of guy in the backcourt is more valuable than having that guy in the front court. But who's a better player, Hunter Dickinson or RJ Davis? RJ Davis. You sure? That's my answer. I can I like it's close. I think Hunter's great. Hunter's definitely the best big. But yeah, if I'm just like ranking the caliber of these guys, I think it's Mark Sears one, RJ Davis two, then Hunter. Yeah, I no, I'm with you on Sears. And I love R.J. Davis. Hunter's just underappreciated, I think, just because he's I mean, not when he's not when he's number one on this list. He can't still be underappreciated, right? I feel like I got to carry the torch for Hunter. <laughs> okay, all right. Marty well, Mush I- killed Marty Mush killed my guy. Jordan Bohannon killed him. I gotta I gotta prop him back up. I have more here. You taking Caleb Love over John L. Davis? Uh, yes. You taking Caleb Love over Kadari Richmond? Yes. Whoa. Why? <laughs> I've seen Caleb Love do it. Do what? Get his team to a Final Four, to a national championship. Shoot them out of it? I've seen him be Pac-12 Player of the Year. Indictment on the Pac-12 more than it is anything else. Respect the Pac-12. You don't think Kadari Richmond would have been Pac-12 Player of the Year? No. Wasn't he Big East Player of the Year? No. Are you sure? I'm positive. Devin Carter was. I don't even know if Kadari was first team all Big East. (laughs) He definitely was. Are you sure? He should have been. Kadari's better than Devin Carter. That's crazy. Not better than Baylor Shireman. I think he is, man. No, whoa! I might have to go to war for Kadari. Kadari was first team All Biggies, just not okay. unanimous. Mm. <laughs> all right, all right. So you I, love this list? You really do? You weren't kidding? You're, you I truly do love about this list. Yeah, yeah. Andy Cats, Big Cats. This is I co-signed this one. I would love my my name to be on this list. Was there anybody that's missing from this? Ah, uh, unless I'm just completely overlooking, I don't know if there's a super senior that is missing from this list. Okay, there we have it. Uh, uh actually, I- I'll just say this: I love Juwan Roberts. I think he's great. There's got to be somebody else I would put on this list over him, and him being eight is kind of crazy. And I love Juwan Roberts. <laughs> it's a doesn't sound like something someone who loves Juwan Roberts would say. But yeah, I mean, come on. Like I like like Umar Balo or Juwan Roberts. I'd take Umar. maybe Juwan Roberts, actually. Now I'm thinking about it. I'd take Umar Balo. Let's move on before you slander anybody else. Some news for topic number two today. The Big Ten and the SEC are discussing a strategic alliance, which would direct them toward a result here where both conferences schedule in such a way that they both receive four automatic bids for the college football playoff. 12-team playoff, 
We're already in year one, going to be in year two very soon. We're already seeing conferences try and manipulate their way to commandeering the matchups in the playoff. Your thoughts? One, uh, my first thoughts are that you should be on some type of Big Ten board because you would be incredible at just midseason negotiations and ideas like this. Like this would be a you idea. Like you call me and be like, hey, what do you what do you think if I say the word alliance? And you would just you would you would really facilitate those type of conversations. Um, I think given I, I don't know. The only thing that doesn't sit right for me is that four number, because once you get to the fourth team in these conferences, are you feeling good about those teams being automatic bids of college football playoffs? No. Like three. Yeah. Four. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. This is a classic case of them getting greedy, which I honestly have to respect, because this is something you and I do all the time. We get greedy. When something good happens, we will literally text each other and be like, can I get greedy for a second? This is what they're doing. If you go in and research what's happened here. So the the SEC and the Big Ten have had these conversations for forever. They were a part of the meetings to get to the point of a 12-team playoff, right? Uh, They were pushing for a 14-team playoff already. Like the moment they got a 12-team playoff across the finish line, the SEC and the Big Ten were like, we want 14 teams in the playoff. They're not going to stop there. They're going to want 16. Then they're going to want 20. It's just going to keep going until we're like, let's just make it a full March Madness-style football tournament. Um, the initial thing that the SEC and Big Ten countered for was a model that goes 3-3-2-2-1, three, three, two, two, meaning the SEC and Big Ten would get three teams in, and then presumably the Big 12 and the ACC would get two teams in, and then there would be one more team from an additional conference. Um, that's interesting because they've immediately flipped from that into, no, we want four. Like, you could very easily get that sort of system approved, I feel like. And instead, it's like, no, we want four. We're we're coming together for four. We're meeting in Nashville this weekend to talk about how we need more teams in the playoff. I'm very confused on it all. Like, how does this even work? Do the SEC and Big Ten just get to make a phone call and be like, we want more teams in the playoff? And then the NCAA is like, okay, sure, cool. I, I don't understand it at all, but... This is definitely where the sport's headed, right? It's like one huge super conference that just supplies all the playoff teams. Yeah, I mean, this is like the idea of the NCAA, because it's not just football, it's basketball, it's everything. They don't want to let like the super conference thing die. Even if they got to slow play it and do little things like this along the ways for it eventually to end up like super conferences. And honestly, maybe it does. Uh, Maybe I'm just being naive thinking that it won't end up like that. But this is just like maybe a quick fix way to try to get to a point where we're at the super conferences and it's super greedy and I'm not with it, even though I'm pro greed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Can you be pro greed and also not love the move? No. Yeah. No, I feel like you got to decide one way or the other, because I mean, right now you're looking at, look at the, the the two conferences. Who is that 14? That would be the automatic bid. I know it's early in the season, but like, I think the big 10 has four teams worth it this year. And the sec definitely does. Like they're probably going to get four anyway. Right. Like unless the flip would be the sec gets like five and the big 10 gets three, which honestly would be kind of fun. Because if I know one thing about alliances from my years of watching the challenge in Survivor is that the important moment for alliances is when the alliance eats each other near the end game. And I feel like that's going to come here at some point. Like, yeah, of course, this is the first year of the playoff. It's week five. Sure, we both just want four. Let's make it an even split. But then you get to week 12 and the SEC has like Ole Miss and Georgia as their fourth and fifth best teams and the big tens fourth team is Michigan and the sec is going to flip and call the NCAA so fast and be like, we deserve five. And then the big Ten's going to be duped, you know? I kind of like that idea, but I would have to one. I'm feeling good about where I'm at conference wise coming off paternity leave. I think I know I got realignment down and I know which teams are where now. And with that said, the SEC would get somewhat slighted in this, but I don't know. I, I know you're saying four Big Ten teams are deserving. I don't know if I would I would say that right now. I mean, I think it would, and what and wouldn't this kill like? Because this would uh, 
whether they mean it or not, this would kill like a a Boise State or a UNLV getting in, right? No, there's a guaranteed 12th team that gets in from a non power. Oh, group. okay. So there still would be that guarantee. That this just hurt. Team. This hurts the ACC Big 12. I'm okay. I kind of like this then. I'm fine with it hurting the ACC. It would be a fourth Big Ten team over like a second team from the Big 12, which right now seems reasonable. But that does seem reasonable. Even the ACC, it seems reasonable. All I know is if I'm if we're all in a big game of Survivor, the moment I hear this, I'm sliding in and asking the Big Ten to go get some wood with me. And then on the walk to the wood, I'm hitting them with a, yeah, you know, the SEC probably thinks they deserve five or six teams in, huh? Huh. This, this is why I'm saying you should be in this. You should you be perfect. Day two of you being back on the show, once again, means I get to go back in my stupid bag for topics. So this is one like I respectfully to Dion, I wouldn't put him through an exercise like this. I would like try and come up with some real things for you. It's like, let's just go through our favorite teams in college basketball and guess if they would be happy with a sweet 16. So that's exactly what I want to do. If we could put in uh, or go in our genie bag and grant wishes you know, let's do that as a topic tomorrow. That sounds fun. But for today, I'm a genie. And your various college basketball teams. And I come up to you, I pull up to your doorstep, and I'm like, I'll give you a sweet 16 right now. Right now you can have a sweet 16. But that's all you get. You're losing in the sweet 16. Would you take it or would you say no? That's what I want to do. Any questions? I'm a genie in a bottle, baby. Come, come, come and get me out. All right. So I'm literally writing down tomorrow we're doing genie grants three wishes. <laughs> that sounds fun. Uh, the other flip I was going to do is from the movie The Box. I was going to say, uh, so each of these teams, you can make a Sweet 16 guaranteed right now, but someone on your team has to die. Do we not want to do that? Is that too dark? A, a, a little bit, yeah. Okay. So let's just do, would they take a Sweet 16 or not then? Does that work? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Let's start with your team, Michigan State. Right now, you can sign up for Tom Izzo's team to make a Sweet 16 and lose in the Sweet 16 this season. You taking that? Yes or no? Am I me? Yeah. I I would not take that. I think Michigan State fans would. Why are you not taking I'm shocked you're not taking that. Uh, well, because I know what that Sweet 16 run would look like. What would it look like? That that one that we had two years ago. And you liked that. That was a fun outcome. The regular season sucked. Well, the, I think the regular season is going to suck anyway. This is just me offering you a free Sweet 16. I'm good. What? <laughs> so you'd rather this go like real south than... Just continue. Or go beyond the Sweet 16. It's not guaranteed. We'll what do you still make the, it. What do you think the percentage likelihoods are here? Without the guarantee? Sure. Well, given given Paga's impact and Izzo and Michigan State, there's still always a chance that they, they make a Sweet 16 no matter what the team looks like. Uh, it's just about getting there. Um, with that said, I put it at like 27%. Maybe seventeen <laughs> percent. What and what about advancing further than Sweet Sixteen? Because that's what you alluded to. There's a chance they go further. Uh probably like three percent. Okay, so you're passing up a three percent chance for a twenty-seven percent chance when you could just take a hundred percent at the Sweet Sixteen. Mm-hmm. I think that's a mathematical error. Wouldn't be my first time. Okay, so you might say no for all these teams then. Would Purdue take a Sweet 16 right now? Yes. See, I think that's a guaranteed no. I think Purdue fans think they can make a national championship game again. They do, but they would take a Sweet 16. Because they've been burned in the past so much? Yes. Really? Yes. I don't know if I agree with that, but maybe. What would you do? I would take that if I'm a Purdue fan. Like, just give me a... Give me an incredible Braden Smith year, and he just goes off, is special, 
uh, and you make a Sweet 16 this year, senior year, Braden, senior year, Fletch, you get over the Sweet 16 hump and get back to the promised land. So Purdue's on the two-year plan that Illinois fans claim they are. Like, yes. it's perfectly okay. Let's just make a Sweet 16, and then next year we'll be special. Yes. I hate two-year plans. Me too. There's... Such an instant gratification guy. I hate two-year plans. Me too. Would Illinois take a Sweet 16 right now if they could? Nothing further. Yes. yes. You don't think they want to build off the Elite Eight from last year? I think given their history in the tournament, a Sweet 16 with this team, a very young team, a new team, they've taken that. See, this is what I think you and I would sign up for for Illinois, but I think Illinois fans would like hesitate and be like, we have a national title ceiling. We're that good. We are the most talented team in Illinois history. But they would be able to pivot once they got to the Sweet 16. They'd be like, this is what we wanted all along. You're right. This is fine. You're right, but that I think the reason they're always – like everything's always okay is the reason they don't do this because there's no need to guarantee anything because it's always okay anyway. If they lose in the first round, it's okay. We'll just replace everybody next year. If they win a national title, it's okay. We just won a national title. I, okay, here's my angle. I think two straight years of getting over the hump that has eluded you so much before would even give some more gratification to it. Like it wasn't just that one year – you got Terrence Shannon back. It's like, oh, this is who Illinois is now. Like, they're going to get to Sweet 16. It's just, how do they get over that hump? I guess that's true. Okay. Uh, I have four more here. This one's the most intriguing one on the list to me. Would Indiana take a Sweet 16 right now? If ours? Yes. You think that's easy? Yes. Very. Maybe that is easier. But it's, in, it's... in my head, they should... They should be wanting more this year. When's the last time Indiana's made a second weekend? Back in the Crean days. Tom Crean? I think, right? Let's check this. I swear Crean made one. Uh, I, I, even, even, even if that's the case, that is a, that's a long time ago. was a long time ago. Uh, they, yeah, they made a Sweet 16 in 2016. 2016? And 2013 and 2012. What were, you doing in 20, what were you doing in 2016? Uh, it depends on the time of year. That was the year I moved here. Yeah, move here. You're now on your third establishment, married with a daughter. Uh, in 2016, I was also probably in that establishment, drunkenly fighting with Zach Hurth after a night out at that place that has popcorn at the bar in Kalamazoo. And now I am now living at my own place in Ferndale with a young child. <laughs> yeah, I was so, rocking. Yes, they would take a sweet 16. <laughs> I was rocking a fedora to a rooftop bar, convincing people I'm Matt Gerard successfully, mind you. That's what I was doing in 2016. There you go. Mm. That would be a fun exercise, by the way, for you and me one day is to like go through all the years of our adult lives and name the most random thing we remember about each year. I feel like we'd have a fun, fun 10 year story. There. That'd be pretty fun, honestly. Uh, okay, I, I guess you're right. But if it were me, I would turn it down because I think this team has Final Four aspirations. But Indiana fans, I think you're right, would take a Sweet 16. What about Kentucky? Because hear me out on this before you just immediately say yes. Kentucky is Kentucky. If we get to the point that we're signing up and saying just a Sweet 16 is okay, that's when you stop being Kentucky to me. They never would have said that with Cal Perry, the head coach. But – but this is year one of Mark Pope. I think that Kentucky fans will sign up for one weekend. They will sign up for a win. So, but if we're saying that, then I think we need to go on record and say Kentucky's not Kentucky anymore. Kentucky wants to win championships. They want to make Final Fours cart. If they, we are they saying do. they'd be happy with a Sweet 16, this is not Kentucky anymore. In year one of Mark Pope, I think they would be happy with a Sweet okay, 16. Okay, so this is not Kentucky anymore. Kentucky fans would say yes to a Sweet 16 and nothing more. What is it? It's not Kentucky. I, th this is before Mark Pope has even coached the game. We're saying they'd be happy with the Sweet 16. This is not Kentucky. And you're what? I would sign up for it. But I'm, you know where I stand on all this. But if Kentucky fans are that real to admit, yeah, we'd be ecstatic with just making a Sweet 16 this year. That'd be an accomplishment. The bar is lowered so much. Would you sign up for a Michigan Final Four this year if it's guaranteed you don't make the tournament for five years straight following? No. Okay. No. That's the Juwan. I don't need that. 
I don't, don't know. want that again. I don't want one good year followed by five horrible ones. Never again. Gotcha. Uh, okay, two more. BYU, are they taking a Sweet 16 right now, yes or no? Of course. They are, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, no, just no, question, no question about it. I hope Whitney Carson's having an awful day. BYU. Wait, what? I meant to say Baylor. Baylor. It's a tough one, too. It is. I want to say no. But they need the Scott Drew narrative switch because Scott Drew has missed the second weekend like every year since the title game. Ooh, I still want to say no, though. Do you want to say differently? You want to say yes, they would? I would encourage Baylor fans to think about saying yes here because I think if this team loses in the round of 32, we have some tough conversations to have. But... But, I mean, this is a team that has national championship dreams. So, I think if you believe in the team, you probably do say no. I hope Michigan State makes that call once those tough times come around. Tom Izzo needs to just find, like, a Mexican establishment, get some chips, and never shout leave out, Never leave where those, you're at. Shout out to Los Tres Amigos. <laughs> One big thing presented by my bookie. What you got? I got a two-parter today, Greg. Uh, one more serious one and one back-to-the-bit one. Uh, fatherly advice. I recommend that everyone who is, uh, you know, in, in process of the birthing, uh, when they're at the hospital, buy a disposable camera, bring to the hospital to take pictures. My wife and I did that. Uh, and we got some heat off those disposable cameras. I brought two of them here. Uh, Greg, tell me, like, look at this, look at this guy fathering right now. That's crazy. I mean, that's a father, father, if I ever seen. Is that the first photo that was ever taken of you with Leon? Yes. So I have a theory cooking because you and I both passed this test. I'm convinced the first picture you take as a dad is the best you will ever look in a photograph. I I mean, that is a great photograph of me. Uh, And this was the second photo of me. You know, I've been high since the birth of my son. You know (laughs) what I'm saying? Like, that's get a disposable camera. We got some great photos of like, our families like seeing them for the first time and holding them. It was my dad's birthday the other day. Shout out to Luther. Happy birthday. Got him like a nice frame, disposable picture of him meeting Leon for the first time. Like it's, it's a, it's a great thing. Now back to regular schedule programming. Greg, where do you stand on pop? (laughs) Uh, I drink it more than I would like to admit. Yeah. And your favorite is diet Coke, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Correct. Yes. Uh, where do you stand on Coke Zero in relation to Diet Coke? It is not superior, although some people would like you to believe it is. Okay, interesting. I, you know, I, I'm of the same standing with that. Uh, with that said, um, I was targeted on TikTok for some reason. This ended up on my FYP. Uh, this this little do this little ditty right here. This little number. It's Oreo flavored. I think Coke Zero. Uh, and I saw it and I was like. Okay, it's speaking to me. I'm going to grab it, and I'm going to try it on this episode and see what we're hitting for here. That, first off, crazy concoction. Coke's got to check themselves. That's what I'm saying, but, like, what if this is heat? Does it I can't even it? tell. No, it smells like a Coke Zero. I really don't even smell like Oreo. How we doing? I don't. Do I know what Oreos taste like? <laughs> do you not eat Oreos? What does it taste uh, like? I mean, there's definitely Oreo undertones. It's actually pretty good. I mean, Coke Zero with Oreo undertones sounds horrible. Not pretty good. But the thing is that you think that, but then you taste it, and it's pretty good. With that said, I think I know what market coke's trying to target with this one it's it, it's pretty simple like there's some White like people. ethan basilla's gonna get his <laughs> hands on this and mix it with like in like a chocolate burnets or something like that and make like a a coke zero oreo bonsai or whatever he's gonna call it and it's gonna take red cedar by storm yeah that makes sense understood uh all right well I don't know what to do with that. I'm glad you tried that. I'm I'm wowed by your ability to still pull off bits with how much 
time you now have to spend in other areas. Like in the past, it would have made sense. Oh, carts just like going to Walgreens and looking for the most obscure thing to buy to use as a bit the next day. I can't believe you like Amazon yourself, Oreo, Coke Zero, just for this bit. Didn't Amazon this actually. That's not what I did. Uh, I was at Target uh, getting diapers. Shout out to Millie Moon brand diapers. That's the brand of diapers we like. Um, and I I saw this on the way out, like at the in the little like section before you get to the checkout counter. Okay, very nice. Uh, my one big thing today. I'm gonna do a first. I'm gonna do a one big thing prediction that by Go the time Caleb. by the time anybody listens to this. This prediction will either be true or false. And I want to see if the power of one big thing has like a special psychic ability. That's what this is going to be. So I was doing my thing card. I was perusing my bookie, exclusive sports book of Sleepers Media, promo code Sleepers, link in the description, match your first deposit. And I I noticed something that stood out to me as interesting for today's Tigers-Astros game card. Odds to hit a home run. Huh. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to bet some of those. Now, uh, it's intriguing because you go through and you look at all of the players that are going to play in this game. And there's quite a few good hitters, Cart. There's quite a few. The Houston Astros have a very good offense. A lot of guys who have hit a lot of home runs in their careers, including Jordan Alvarez, Alex Bregman, Kyle Tucker, Jose Altuve. Uh, they've got four others in, in in the teens in home runs on the season. A lot of big home run hitters. Cart, you know who has the best odds to hit a home run in this game? Riley Green, Spencer Torkelson, uh, the Torkinator. Cart, that doesn't make a lot of sense because Spencer Torkelson only has ten home runs on the year. Overwhelmingly, Spencer Torkelson has been a disaster this year. Spencer Torkelson went down to Triple A for about two months where he didn't even perform well. You're telling me in game one. Of the wild card round on the road in Houston against a team that's made the ALCS for seven straight years. Spencer Torkelson is the most likely to hit a home run. That feel a little fishy to you? Hmm. It's a short porch out there in Houston. It's a short porch out there in the left field. Torkelson's hitting a bomb today. Torkelson will be the reason the Detroit Tigers win game one of this wild card series. Book it. That's my prediction. And if I'm wrong, Forget it ever happened. That's the show. We'll be here tomorrow. Goodbye.